Should we get started? Yeah, let's do it. All right, thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. If you have got a seat next to you, raise your hand. I know there are some people outside. I think you've done an awesome job of packing yourselves in beautifully. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you everyone who's tried to come in. Hopefully you're, you're going to watch on YouTube later and catch up with all the latest updates from the Cilium project. Can we start with a quick show of hands? How many of you ha are already using Cilium? Pretty good number of you. Okay, awesome. Do we have any people here who have contributed to Cilium? Yes, yeah, smaller number, but we very much appreciate your work. Okay, fantastic. So, yeah, welcome to Cilium. My name's Liz Rice. I work for iSurveillant, which is the company that originally created the Cilium project, which consists of several pieces. The three main parts are Cilium itself, the networking component that uh, you probably all know and love, uh, which provides networking capabilities, incredibly high performance, incredibly scalable, and has kind of become the de facto networking solution in the cloud native world. Complementing that, there's Hubble, which provides network observability that you can use alongside Cilium. And then finally, there is the, the new cousin in the Cilium family, which is Tetragon. Can we get a show of hands? Anyone here using Tetragon? Yeah, quite a few of you, good. So run, uh, runtime security and observability. All of these things based on the amazing technology that is eBPF. And uh, as you probably all know, I'm a massive fan of eBPF. Have a quick look at Tetragon, um, since it's newer and maybe less familiar to uh, some of the folks in the audience. Tetragon reached 1.0 status uh, just in time for the last KubeCon in North America. So it's providing runtime security and observability by hooking into all kinds of really interesting events in the kernel, things like file access, network access, privilege escalation, all the things that the kernel is responsible for, we can hook into the, into the kernel using eBPF and provide these incredible uh, detailed information about what may be security relevant events. What's more, we can filter those events in the kernel and that means it's incredibly uh, high performance, very, very low overhead. We've seen some measurements doing some very kind of useful uh, observability running at less than 2% CPU overhead, which is well worthwhile to catch things like access to sensitive files that you're not expecting. Okay, so we have just re released a few weeks ago, Cilium 1.15. There are a ton of great new features in that release, including uh, the Gateway API support. I, anyone here using Gateway API already? Few hands. So it's, I, I think, a pretty hot topic in the, uh, in the service mesh world. It's a really nice innovation, kind of replacing ingress with lots more flexibility and, and new features for routing ingress traffic. There's quite a few uh, security improvements in 1.15, things like session authentication for BGP sessions. There's been a ton of contributions in Hubble, helping you debug network problems. There's also a contribution uh, of a new provider so that you can install Cilium with Terraform or OpenTofu. And there are lots of scaling and performance improvements. Uh, one particular one that I think is Nice is the ability for cluster mesh to handle more than 500 clusters. So that's very cool. I kind of mentioned this already, the, the 1.0 release of Tetragon. I'd forgotten that I had this really nice little uh, graph here showing how low the performance uh, overhead is for Tetragon, even compared to other eBPF-based solutions because of the fact that we can filter inside the kernel. Another thing that happened this week that was new was our first ever in-person Cilium Developer Summit. So we had participants, folks who were really active committers and developers from, uh, what's that, eight, nine different companies, 
Big thanks to Datadog for hosting us in their beautiful offices in Paris. I think I heard nothing but amazing feedback for how much that uh, group of people were able to, to do during that one day. So uh, can we give a round of applause actually for Datadog for supporting that? So that's a very, very quick update on what's been happening in the Cilium project. I think it's now time to introduce the first of our kind of guest speakers, Nico from White Duck. I'm not going to attempt to say your surname, I've bottled it, uh, to talk about using Cilium in the wild. Welcome, Nico. Hey, everyone. <laughs> yeah, short introduction of mine. So it's uh, Meisenzahl. So it's Nico Meisenzahl. I'm from Germany, sorry. Um, so basically, I don't, will not do a quick introduction, it's just about, so we are helping our customers building cloud native applications, running them, bringing them into the cloud, um, or even modernizing applications. And this is basically the context I'm, I'm, I'm planning to talk about um, today. So I have, I think, three slides with some examples where really Cilium can help you um, or help our customers to reduce complexity, um, which is every time a good thing, I guess. Yeah, um, so first one, um, Liz already mentioned uh, Gateway API. Um, and this is really great. So Gateway API, uh, if you know, it's basically the rising star to somehow um, yeah, get traffic routed to your applications or expose your application in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we are all used to, to Ingress, um, and Gateway API is really the next step. And basically, I guess every one of us will move there somehow in the, um, soon and so on. Yeah. Um, and as mentioned, application ingress into a cluster is really a crucial component. So it's, it's really good or a good thing to make sure that it's easy maintainable. So that you don't bring in multiple tools, different um, yeah, integrations and so on. And then you have, I don't know, 10, 15 different tools doing something in your cluster. If you shrink down the number, it's just easier to maintain to operate your cluster. So thinking about the two operations, for example. Um, yeah. Um, and Cilium, with the support now for a gateway app going uh, to 1.0, it's basically the perfect fit. So you have Cilium in your cluster anyway to do all the networking, the CNI stuff, so you can just use it for your ingress um, of your application. You don't need a sec tool, another deployment, uh, you don't need to maintain uh, a different thing, so just your Cilium and you're fine, out of the box. Just makes things easier. Yeah, next one is, um, once again, Hedragon, also mentioned some, uh, mentioned some minutes ago. Um, it's all about container runtime security and the, the baseline for your container runtime. Um, so if you talk about container security or container uh, security, or just security in common, um, to be honest, most companies out there do not care at all. Um, it's basically the same like with testing. Um, you need money to do it, you need people to maintain it, and you don't get any features, which is basically a bad idea. Um, so it's really, really important to at least get some baseline uh, perspectives into your cluster, and Hadragon can really help you here um, to make sure that stuff is running on a cluster is secure, or even if something is running in a cluster which shouldn't run in a cluster, to be aware of it and possibly also um, block it. Yeah. Um, and other hand, security needs to be easy, otherwise nobody will invest into security. Um, so it's really crucial to get um, the best practices into your cluster um, pretty easy. And this is really great with the last release. Um, we got the default observability uh, policies that are real game changer. You have um, all the policies you need. You can just apply them to your cluster um, or you customize them on your need, but you have really a baseline to really start with. Um, so it's getting really, really easy to secure your container runtime security. Um, so we go shout us to this feature. Um, we waited so long for it. Yeah, last but not least, um, as you saw on my introduction slide, so I'm basically working in the cloud with mismanaged offerings, but still there, updating and maintaining clusters can be a pain. So they have so complex dependencies, um, you need to think of an updating cluster. So it's a, a good idea, uh, idea to really yeah, treat your clusters like cattle and not, not pets, like we do, like we did with virtual machines earlier, like we do with our container images or containers. Um, so really, um, instead of dating them up, just delete them, bring up new ones. Um, and 
So there's also a cilium which can help with that one. Um, and here I'm talking about the cilium cluster mesh feature, which allows you to integrate different clusters um, and then yeah, routing traffic between those clusters. You can think about AB deployments, for example, um, blue-green deployments. Um, so you have multiple clusters and the services can talk to each other. Um, so with that in place, you can think about, um, in this example, building, for example, stateless clusters. Let's think about you have uh, APIs running in your, um, in your cluster or even um, uh, front ends and you need a database, you can bring the database to a stateful cluster, um, which maybe doesn't need to be so flexible like the cluster where your other workloads run on it and you can just then use stateful cluster, uh, stateless clusters and redeploy them all the time. Um, and you just have one cluster with a state which might be more complex but it's maybe also more stable than, um, than your workload clusters and then basically, um, yeah, delete your clusters, bring in new ones and route the traffic um, to the stateful um, cluster. Um, also really, really a helpful feature here. Um, so just a quick uh, yeah, overview of some of the things we're doing with Helium and our customers um, to make life easier for us and also for our customers. Um, yeah, and with this, I would end my five minutes, hopefully. Um, and get over to the next one. So thank you for Nico. And our next speaker is uh, from a, a company that has been a really long time user of, uh, of Cilium and uh, Vlad has been a contributor, a committer and a user for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to hearing about his experiences with Cilium. Please welcome Vlad from Palantir. Okay, this work? Yep, perfect. Uh, so my name is Vlad. Uh, I'm an engineering lead at Palantir. Been with Palantir for almost nine years now and a Cilium committer for, I think, 2019. Uh, at Palantir, I mostly work with the teams that manage our Kate's offerings. Uh, we deploy on commercial cloud, classified cloud, on-premise and, uh, and edge. Uh, I won't spend much time on what Palantir is doing. You can Google that, but the one liner is that uh, we're, help, we're, we're developing software that helps commercial entities and governments make a better sense of, uh, of their data. In, um, this talk is going to be our history on like how we picked up Cilium, how we are using Cilium, and how our journey evolved with uh, with the Cilium community. So everything started around uh, 2015 for Palantir when we launched our initial SaaS platform. That was uh, basically built on top of uh, VMs managed with Puppet and a lot of like old school tech. In 2017, we decided we wanted the change, so we swapped to, to running everything on uh, on Kates. Uh, now we're available on like all the major hyperscalers and basically on-premise on and edge as well. So we picked up uh, Cilium in, in 2018. Uh, so the case journey for Palantir started in uh, 2017 uh, when we decided to like uh, re-architect everything. Initially, um, uh, we, uh, the journey with Cilium started from a very simple premise and evolved over time organically. Our initial CNI that uh, we deployed in our case clusters was, uh, was Calico, but it had uh, quite a few drawbacks. Two of them were first lack of network policy support, and the second one was like very hard to like understand like what's happening inside the inside the cluster at the network layer for us. In 2018, we discovered Cilium, and at KubeCon North America in, in Seattle, we started talking with uh, uh, with Thomas about like how can we port over our, our platform to, to Cilium. We wanted better observability from our platform, so Palantir and, uh, and the Cilium community decided together to build uh, what evolved into being the Amazon ENI routing mode. Uh, this allowed basically each pod to get a VPC uh, IP, like a native VPC IP, and like, the routing was, uh, was handled by, uh, by the cloud provider in our case. Uh, so we, we did that, we converted to using Cilium, and then it was time to, uh, to flip the, the, the flag to enable uh, policy support. So we started using L3, L4 policies, and then we moved into uh, DNS-based filtering using like two FQDN uh, policies. Uh, 2019 brought also like new challenges along with it. We did a few Cilium upgrades and pretty quickly we found that uh, uh, Palantir, uh, for better or worse, is like a, a very good distressor for the, for the Cilium uh, uh, agent itself. So uh, to, to define our clusters, I would use just the word entropy. 
We have a lot of uh, node entropy. Nodes come and go very fast. Pods come and go very fast, and also network policies come and go very fast. And these are like in uh, in a very like high scale and, and a lot of like churn as well inside the cluster. So uh, this quickly exposed a lot of hot paths in the Silim agent, Silim operator itself. So together. Um, uh, Palantir and, and, and Selim uh, committers uh, worked on uh, delivering fixes for, uh, for these. Uh, 2019 was an interesting year for, for Palantir. We decided to embark on achieving our FedRAMP accreditation. I, go, I won't go into details about like, what FedRAMP is, uh, but one piece of the accreditation uh, procedure is that uh, one requirement is that all your traffic needs to be encrypted with the FIPS validated cipher. So for those who, who deal with FIPS, like know how, how much trouble this is. Again, we turned our eyes at, uh, at Cilium and decided to give the IPsec encryption feature a try. It, uh, in the end, it allowed us to, to pass the audits uh, with, with flying colors, and we didn't have to do any major re-architecture of our platform, like recompiling binaries to use a FIPS version of OpenSSL and, and other things like deploying sidecars to, to encrypt the traffic. Uh, we gave a talk at KubeCon in Chicago about this, so just Google Palantir and FedRAMP compliance, KubeCon, and you're going to find more details about it. 2020, we decided to take on a more ambitious project. Uh, over time, we realized that old school uh, security tooling doesn't really work with, uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, one tool that uh, we make use in our clusters is called OSCRE. It's a tool uh, open sourced by, uh, by Meta, and it's basically an uh, endpoint detection and, and response tool. So if you look at the logs of OSQuery to see like what activity your processes do on, on a host, you're going to see that they don't have any like pod container information. Everything seems to, to be coming from the same uh, uh, different, different process IDs, but the same binary. So you don't have any, any case information associated with, uh, with them. At that point in time, Isovalent internally was working on, uh, on a tool called uh, Hubble FGS. That's basically the early name for, uh, for Tetragon. And the tool was designed to just give security teams a better uh, overview into, like, into the activity that's uh, happening into, into their clusters. Uh, our goal was to have an end-to-end -end, uh, auditing process for the events happening in the cluster. And one question we wanted to answer is, for example, uh, what um, if we see a process doing some malicious activity, what service account or like what image was uh, was running inside the cluster that was doing that um, that activity? Uh, in 2021, we started expanding our footprint. We added support for other big hyperscalers like GCP and um, and Azure into our um, into our offering, uh, and we started to convert our on-premise. Um, uh, fleet as well to, to Kate. So given how well the partnership with Cilium evolved over time, we're basically taking the CNI and its friends basically everywhere where, um, where we're heading. I want to take some time to explain into more detail like how we use Hubble and Tetracon at, uh, at Palantir. So our platform is composed around like 100 plus microservices. And uh, when we started our cloud journey, we decided that we need to have a better way of deploying these things to production. So we created internally a, a, a way for products to declare how much CPU disk memory they need, but also we gave them a way of like declare what other services they need to talk to. So for example, microservice A can say, I need to talk to microservice B over some port. If you take this uh, one step further, you realize that soon you have a graph of like all the network communication that should happen inside your cluster. Uh, using uh, Hubble, uh, uh, so before that, uh, Given now we have the graph, we also decided to build a tool internally that automatically creates Cilium network policies to secure this traffic. So now with Hubble, you can observe all this traffic, and if you see any Hubble, any drop in, in the data path, you, you can assess two things. Either we have a bug in our tool that creates CMPs, we, uh, we did something wrong over there, or there's like malicious activity inside our cluster. So this, this covers the network observability piece, on the runtime observability piece, we use Tetragon to observe syscalls that are, that are happening inside the cluster. So we're very interested in, for example, like open, close, connect, send syscalls. Um, we also observe socket activity that happens in, into, on our hosts. So with this, our InfoSec team basically has superpowers to see like end-to-end -end tracing of what's happening inside the clusters. 
that's all for me, and now we're going to Christine. All right, I'm not as tall as you are, so. <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about Slim's mutual authentication. So this was something that the Cilium team has introduced a couple of releases ago, and a lot of work has gone into it, and I'm gonna go over what it is and what's beyond. So as a recap, Cilium has this concept of Cilium identities. So a set of labels on pod group, they essentially group workloads together. And using these identities is how Cilium makes policy decisions. And so before identity A workloads can communicate with identity B workloads, you want to address some of these concerns, like are we authenticated, are you who you say you are, um, are we authorized, are we even allowed to be communicating with each other, and lastly, is our data protected or encrypted? So with mutual authentication, it addresses the first concern. So now with mutual auth, we have authorization there, and then network policies are something that Cilium has always been uh, performing really well with, and they're really robust. And lastly, encryption. So for example, WireGuard. And so when you install Cilium with mutual auth installed, a Cilium, a Spiffy Spire server is deployed in your cluster. And a per node Spire agent gets its own identity from the Spire server. And so when a connection is initiated between Cilium's identity A to identity B, a policy check is completed for mutual authentication. And if that passes from the Cilium agents, communication can flow encrypted, for example, with WireGuard here. So what does it look like just to get started? So first off, I'm showing you the Cilium CLI tools, but this is, can also be enabled with Helm, so very easy and lightweight. So first, you've got to install Cilium with version 1.15 and enable WireGuard encryption. And so once that's provisioned, you make sure you enable mutual authentication with these install flags, either, again, through Helm or Cilium CLI. And then once that passes, you just have to create a Cilium network policy. So you can really see how transparent, uh, easy, lightweight it is. You just have to add those two lines of YAML there, authentication mode required, and you have mutual authentication. And so what's beyond what's next for mutual authentication? So this is where we need your help. So we'd like to improve and harden this feature as usual. Last year, concerns of the community were raised on potential corner edge use cases, essentially IP cache manipulation spoofing. And so there's a CFP link here on this uh, slide and it outlines the mitigations on this potential threat. And there are two proposals um, outlined here. So the first one is to use Cilium with 1.15, like I showed on the previous slide, um, where WireGuard encapsulate packets with VXLAN, adding the Cilium ID in the header so spoofing is not possible. And then the second one is to use a new per connection mode, which would leverage the contract table, um, adding two bits for auth required and auth completed. So please, like, read this. We need your help. We would like to make this feature better for you guys. So also, if you'd like to keep just track on the issue, if you don't want to read the CFP per se, uh, you can keep up to date with any new improvements on this one, the 28986. And then there's also this new blog post that's been posted live today. So check that out if you'd like to read more about it and stay up to date. And last off, I'll hand it back to Liz. <laughs> Uh, yeah, do you, uh, I mean, everything in Cilium, we're always keen to get feedback, we're keen to hear about how things are working, you know, in your production environments. So, uh, yeah, we'd love feedback, uh, particularly on uh, how this mutual authentication is working for you and uh, some of the mitigations that are laid out in that blog post. We'd love your feedback. Okay, so uh, I can't see what of that. Yes, the slide is talking about developer meetings, that's good. Uh, we have a weekly meeting, we've been having a weekly developer meeting for a very long time on Wednesdays and uh, probably about a year ago we started doing an Asia Pacific friendly time zone as well, which happens monthly. And we've just held the first of the monthly Tetragon meetings, those happen on the second Monday of every month. Uh, You'll find the agendas, all the details about those information in the readmes for the Cilium project or the Tetragon project. 
And if you want to come along, if there's a topic you want to add, simply add it into that, uh, the document that you'll find link from the README and uh, you'll be on the agenda and it's a friendly crowd who would love to hear you know, what it is that you are interested in developing or the problem that you think needs solving and uh, yeah, it's, it's a friendly group. We also have the contributor ladder, so if you are new to the community and you want to get involved, particularly on the kind of coding side, you know, how to get involved uh, on the kind of steps towards becoming a committer, this is all laid out in the community uh, repo within the organisation. We also very much appreciate when people have non-code contributions to make. So if you're interested in writing a blog post or you want to just tell us about a blog post or a talk that you've done that's related to Cilium, we'd love to support that. We'd love to um, you know, help amplify your stories. Uh, I mean, as you can see, there's quite a lot of people who are interested in Cilium. So uh, I think it's great if we can facilitate you kind of sharing those stories with each other. If you are using Cilium and you would like to write or be interviewed for a case study, then there's a, a form on Cilium.io you can fill in or you can just reach out to us through the Slack channel to say, yeah, we'd love to do a case study because we really like to hear about how people are using Cilium in the wild, how, you're, uh, how you found it, what benefits you've had, maybe what problems you encountered along the way as well. Uh, so we want to hear those case studies and uh, we'd be delighted to publish those on the website. So I think that is all the updates we had for today. If you're not already in the Cilium and eBPF Slack, then do join us there. Uh, you'll find everything in GitHub on Cilium or through Cilium.io. We'd love to hear about your thoughts on this session and uh, I think we should just give a round of applause to all our speakers again. Uh, we've probably got like a couple of minutes for questions if, uh, if you have any, I think. Sorry? Oh, yes, I should mention, I have been reminded to mention that we, there is, of course, a Cilium booth in the Project Pavilion. So that's another great place to come and chat, meet the people who are working on the code, uh, come and get involved. Thank you so much. <laughs>